Good evening. Uh, I've been given the signal to go ahead that we've got uh, slides up and a stream running. I go ahead and grab a songbook um, or watch on the screen. Number 57, 57. Uh, after this song, our brother Dave will lead us in a prayer. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, now forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, <coughs> new mercies I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. It is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening and we're so grateful, Father, for this beautiful day. The uh, temperatures have cooled off a bit and it's much drier out there, Father. We're thankful for this season, even though it's short. We do enjoy it, Father. We do love all the seasons here in New England. We're so grateful for all of them. Father, we pray um, for um, our brother, Park and Linda, as they travel down to Texas, we're hopeful, Father, that their journey is safe. And we pray also for what is going on in this country right now, Father. It seems like things that um, uh, were good are now bad, and what were bad are now good. What was not acceptable is now acceptable. You know, we, we're just, um, we don't know really what to think sometimes, Father. We know we're not to worry about these things, because you've told us so many different times not to worry. So help us not to do that. Help us to try to steer clear of things, Father, like that. Um, we're hopeful that our influence um, in our neighborhoods where we work, um, we can show Jesus to these people, Father, because we know people need it. And the only difference between uh, people are the condition of their soul. 
So help us to continue to spread Jesus um, in our lives, Father. Um, how we act, what we say, and what we do is so very important. Father, we pray um, for areas uh, in this world, in this country, especially where there's violence. We pray for peace. And where there's hate, we pray for love. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Number 626, and after this, uh, Jerry will bring us our devotional thought. 626. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring. With loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring. With fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost by restless passions taught, redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with one accord. With us the work to share, with us we approach to dare, with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Good evening. Good to see you here this evening. And if you're listening to us on our YouTube channel, welcome as well. I always get nervous when I do this. Uh, it's not from a lack of preparation. It's from just wanting to do so well. So... I don't put you asleep now. I have another chance when we do the class, so I'm coming for you. Uh, all kidding aside, uh, it's very important uh, to me to try and say something that, you know, w when I prepare our first prayer is, God, what would you say if you were standing in our pulpit? And I let that kind of guide uh, how, what I uh, talk about. And also, uh, I've once heard a definition of, of preaching, and the preacher said that when he preaches, he preaches to himself, and he just lets the audience live in, uh, listen in. So there's some of that going on tonight. Turn to Psalm 51. This is, uh, I, I, I use this, this psalm more often than I'm comfortable admitting. But it does, uh, sometimes it does speak to my soul. It says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin, and my, uh, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Make me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with birth offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered in your, on your altar. The thing that jumps out at me when I read this psalm is that it is, it is against God that we sin. No matter what we do to each other, we are sinning against God, and we sometimes forget about that. It is only against God that we sin. Also, it is only to God to whom we confess. And it is only to God who we ask for forgiveness. And also, no one can confess for us. Uh, I know sometimes... Uh, we do things and, well, I want to apologize on behalf of so-and-so. Well, you know, when it comes, when we've offended God, it's incumbent upon us to go to God and confess. Also, when we offend each other, Jesus is very clear in Matthew, says that when you've offended your brother or sister, you need to go to that person be reconciled to that person. No one can do that for you. Also, it is only God who can forgive our sins. No one can ask for forgiveness on our behalf. Although, I'm not above trying, Lord, please forgive this person for. Please forgive that person for. But it is incumbent, again, the onus is upon the person who sins to seek forgiveness from God. If, and it is only God who restores us. Uh, remember your baptism? Remember the joy that you had coming out of the waters? We form our circle. You receive the hugs and welcome of your new brothers and sisters and the joy that you feel for a time after that, that is what I see when I see a renewed and steadfast spirit, is that feeling you had when you came up out of the waters of baptism, turning away from your former life, starting to walk towards God, being faithful. The presence of God, when we were baptized, God gave us his Holy Spirit. He is always dwelling within us. Do not cast me away. Do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. There have been times where if that had happened, I could not have blamed God. Because when he speaks, it's right. When he judges, it's just. Restore the joy of your salvation. Again, the day of your baptism. Sometimes we're out here struggling and failing miserably. And... Uh, we go to God, we confess, we repent, and we really are very tough on ourselves. But if we do those things, God tells us that he forgives us. The blood of his son washes us from all unrighteousness. And he puts all of these sins that we've confessed into the great ocean of his forgetfulness. Sustain me with a willing service. 
We obey, we serve God because we want to, not because we have to. We don't do it because we're concerned that he's going to watch us, see us mess up, and zap us with a thunderbolt, lightning bolt, or some other calamity. We do it because of a great sense of appreciation for what he has done for us, the joy of our salvation, the gratitude for God's salvation. So tonight, I, I encourage you, if you've not heard the gospel, is to to hear the gospel that you are a sinner. We are all sinners, and that God paid the, the price of your sin, which the Book of Romans tells us that uh, the wages of sin is death, and that uh, all of us who have not repented, we will see God and we will be judged because of our sin. You need to believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is who he says he is. The book of Hebrews says that those who wish to know God must believe that he exists. There are some who claim that uh, they don't believe that. Then we need to confess that Jesus is Lord, Romans 8.10. We need to repent of our sins, and then we need to be baptized for the remission of those sins, Acts 2.38. And then upon coming out of the waters of baptism, we need to live faithfully before God. So if you're not a Christian and you would like to take those steps, we would love to guide you and assist you and teach you more fully what they mean. If you are a Christian and you kind of tripped and fell. You kind of blew it. It's not too late. Now's the time to repent. Now's the time to confess. Now's the time to get the, the grace and forgiveness that God offers for you. And also, now is the time we will sing a song to try and encourage you. Let's stand and sing together. Number 552. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with my spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Please be seated. Hello, all. A couple announcements before we move all on to our, uh, our, our adult class. Uh, I have a note here from Dave Scary. He needs help. Okay, so Dave needed help at one point for restocking the pantry, and you may have seen that announcement go out. So he says he's good. So thank you. Let's see. Kevin Glenn's having back issues. He wanted to let us know that and ask for our prayers. Uh, he says, thank Will for mowing this morning. Eh, I don't know if we should be thanking him or not. He he kind of likes doing it with that new tractor. I. I don't know. He should. I'm thinking Will should. I'm thinking Will should be thanking us. 
I'm thinking Will should thank us for allowing allowing him to use the mower to cut the grass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just a reminder, uh, heavy trucks, trucks, vans that do not have handicap plates, please park in the lower lot, I suspect. Well, I would like if we would do that to like next spring, give, give that uh, driveway time to set up. Um, prayers go out to Park and Linda as they travel to their adventures in Texas. They're still on the road. Uh, I haven't heard from them, so I guess that's good news. They uh, uh, should get there hopefully all goes well by Friday, and uh, I've asked I've asked Linda not to take Park out, at least not on the road. She wants to she wants to do that. Wait till they get to Texas. Uh, let's see. Our our elder our minister search goes on. Uh, pray for the school year, the kids, the teachers, and the parents. And again, the uh, traditional Labor Day picnic, uh, we're going to have that here at the building on Monday, September the 7th at 6 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. If you're not around to sign the sheet, just give Kathy a call in the office, and uh, she'll make sure you're on the list just so we know how many people to set up for. Bring your own lawn chairs or blankets. We'll supply the plastic, and... Uh, We'll, we'll be following the standard guidelines that we use for any activity here on the on the property as far as COVID stuff. Uh, if there's any others on the prayer list, they can like the, that you see there. I'm sure it'd be helpful. Just give them a call or a phone call. I'm sure they would appreciate that. If there's any, anybody else that needs to be added or deleted, uh, let Kathy know as well. So you, you you're bouncing in your seat there like you're going to sing a song. Short one. You don't want to cut into Jerry's time, right? Yeah, thank you. Go okay. Thank you. Number 38. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Hello again. I'm going to be uh, giving my knees a little respite here. <sighs> Would everybody go? Preacher dude was uh, when I filled in for him a couple of times. Uh, Wes, do I need to turn on the lapel mic, or can you hear me okay? Okay. Can you hear me? Now? Okay. Well, S Sister uh, Potter here was having trouble hearing me. I don't know if it's her getting more deaf or me not being loud enough. As I was saying, uh, when I filled in for, for Park when he was ill and uh, when he was, took some time off, I started a survey of, of Acts. Well, I'm going to continue in a book of Acts where Park left off. Uh, it won't be as much of a survey, but then again, it won't be as deep. In other words, we're going to go through the material, but we're not going to mine every nugget of truth and wisdom that we find and the confident expectation that we will uh, 
come this way again and what we miss this time, this way, this pass, we'll pick up next time. So that's, that's my plan. And so as we begin, would you please uh, bow with me? And let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to, to, to pause from the cares of the world, to uh, reflect upon you and to, uh, to study and glean something perhaps of when the church first began, uh, the issues which uh, they struggled with, the successes that they've had, the failures that they went through, uh, we know that there was severe persecution in the first century, uh, not too long after the church began, that many of our brethren gave their lives in service to you with the confident expectation that, the, that death was no longer a, a bar, a prevention from serving you. And that uh, when we do die, and all of us are going to pass away at some point, we will be with you in paradise, as so many who have gone before us. So, Lord, please be with us this evening. Please be with me as uh, I bring the lesson. Uh, I pray for discussion. I pray for that uh, we will walk out of this building at the end of this period, uh, knowing something perhaps that we didn't know before, that we might be drawn closer to you than we were when we came into this building this evening. For indeed, that is our purpose, is to continually learn about you, to continually draw closer to you, and to learn of you. As Jesus told us in the Great Commission is to teach, to make disciples of all men and women, and to teach everything that he taught us. And so we strive to do that tonight. Acts chapter 4. I think we'll read the first 12 verses and, and go from there. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power, or in what name, have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And so, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the apostles used to spend time in the temple talking about Jesus. And on this occasion, as we found, saw in chapter 3, they saw a man who had been lame since birth and asking for alms. 
And Peter stopped, took pity on the man, said, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have, we give you. And then he said, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. So that's what happened. And as a result of that happening, people were amazed, and people were running towards Peter and, and John and the man who was just healed. And uh, Peter said, no, why are you so amazed at this? And because of the kerfuffle, the, the great commotion that was must have been caused by that, the temple officials, including the captain of the temple god, the Sadducees, came up to them. And it says that there were priests, the, camp, the captain of the temple god, and Sadducees. The priest, I'm assuming here that they're the average everyday servants in the temple who are doing their priestly duties, uh, Levitical priests. Uh, the captain of the temple god. Can anyone tell me where in the law God made provision to establish a temple god? Who were these people and why were they there? Anybody? You recall that during this time, uh, Israel was under Roman occupation. And one of the things that Romans would not tolerate was riot, was uh, a disturbance, was a disruption in the status quo. And so uh, the Jews were allowed uh, to pretty much uh, rule over their civil affairs, their, their normal everyday uh, life. And the temple of the, uh, the captain of the temple god was in charge of the group of men who were at the temple to keep the peace. Uh, because, again, if they could maintain order, then the Romans need not ever get excited and dispatch their soldiers to quell the disturbance. Um, also, the Sadducees. Any thoughts on who the Sadducees were? Correct. They were sent west. They're also a little more liberal in what they allowed. Uh, so they were a little more inclined to reaffirm. During that day, there were essentially three sects of, of, of the Jewish religious people. One sect were called the Essenes. They were kind of Stoics, lived out in the desert. Uh, practice ceremonial washings, and you don't hear a whole lot about them. Uh, Josephus uh, says, makes mention of them. Darlene? It dawns on me that Caiaphas was, uh, was uh, one of the guys also who was there for the, the, the arrest and the beatings and Correct. everything that happened to Jesus. So. Both... In well, Annas and Caiaphas are related in that Caiaphas is Annas's son-in-law. Uh, but getting back to the to, to the Sadducees, uh, the Essenes we talked about, there were the Pharisees, who you know were the re religious zealots. They were extremely conservative, uh, trying to be doctrinally pure believed in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Old Testament, but they also believed in the teachings of noted rabbis 
who they would cite as an authority on interpreting of the five books of the Old Testament. Uh, the Sadducees uh, were also known as Hellenists in that they thought that the Greek culture and the Greek language was something that ought to be incorporated into Judaism. And uh, as Wesley said, they were extremely liberal because uh, they did not believe in angels, they did not believe in the resurrection, they did not believe in the teachings of noted rabbis as the Pharisees did. Uh, they weren't, they thought that the laws were too strict. And, uh, and so they, uh, they kind of went a different way. So the Pharisees were the extreme, narrow-minded conservatives. The Sadducees were the more liberal, uh, who wanted to incorporate the, the advantages of Greek language and culture into uh, Judaism. Also, the Sadducees, uh, Annas was a Sadducee, Caiaphas was a Sadducee, and uh, he was, both of these men were high priests. Annas, he was high priest. Uh, I got it written down somewhere. S he served as high priest from about 6 to 15, 1, 5 AD. His son Caiaphas served as uh, high priest from 18 to about 36 A.D., the events of Jesus' passion and crucifixion was about 33 A.D. And the interesting thing is that Annas was appointed by Quirinius, who was a, a Roman legate uh, or uh, governor of Syria, which, if, if I remember my Old Testament, uh, that is not how the high priest got appointed, not by the ruling governor of a particular province. But because uh, the Sadducees had common cause with the Romans, and were they're the kind of, they they were the people who wanted to uh, accommodate so that they can get along. They believed that cooperation, that accommodating the Romans was uh, better for the nation than confronting the Romans regardless of the religious offense that the Romans may do, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So the, the Sadducees were uh, also the majority party in the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling, ruling council. And the Pharisees made up a part of it. So... Getting back to jo Peter and John, they committed the great offense of healing somebody in the name of Jesus. Uh, a man lame from birth, when the people saw this, they ran to them, which, disturbance. They didn't, you know, if the Romans see this, they don't know what's happening. Uh, So that's, we talked about the temple God and the Sadducees. So what did the uh, rulers do once they confronted Peter and John about what they did? Is they took them into custody. They arrested them. They locked them up. Um, and, and the reason being, again, is that disturbance caused by the healing and the constant preaching about this convicted criminal who they had crucified. And we're told that many who came, who heard, came to believe, and the number came to be about 5,000 men. That's not including women or children. 
so you can probably bet that that number was higher. So they uh, are brought, they're locked up. The next day they're brought before the Sanhedrin, who was the Jewish high court, but also was the ruling council of Jerusalem. And the Romans permitted the council to exercise authority over the civic life of the Jews. That's what I was trying to say earlier. And membership of the Sanhedrin consisted of the high priest, who was the presiding officer, a majority of Sadducees, a minority of Pharisees, ruling priests, landed aristocrats, that's rich people that own land, and experts in the law of Moses, and it consisted of 71 men. And at this time, uh, the high priest, as I said, was, was Caiaphas. And Annas, although he wasn't the high priest, he was kind of like the deputy high priest because he still wielded great influence in Jerusalem and, and among his contacts. And so the trial begins, and they asked Peter and John, by what power or in what name have you done this? And, and beginning in verse 8 of chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name that this man stands here before you in good faith. So, so far, Peter has told the Sanhedrin that it was in Jesus' name and by his power that this man who was lame began to walk again. This same Jesus, the Nazarene, whom uh, they had crucified, the, the Jews, and who God had raised from the grave. But Peter goes on, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. That's a reference to Psalm 118, verse 22, a, prophecy, a messianic prophecy. And then Peter closes out by saying, there is salvation in no one else. So Peter was not shy about telling the, the religious leaders what was going on and how they had done what they had done. Any comments? Darlene? Because the official story was disciples overpowered the Roman guard and stole Jesus' body from the tomb. And they had to, they bribed the Romans to go along with that story. So I imagine there are some people who still believe that, but then there's the problem of Jesus appearing to the Twelve, and then at one point before he resurrected to 500 people at the same time, so there were witnesses that Jesus was had walked the earth, was risen from the dead. But I guess they just didn't want them to talk about it, to remind people that, hey, this Jesus is still alive. Anybody else? Will.
says they were a Jewish, Jewish sect whose members came from the secret Hebrew line and controlled the temple. They did not believe in a resurrection or a personal Messiah, but held that the Messianic age, an ideal time, was soon, was then present and must be preserved. Now, anyway, see, they had, they were supposed to be in charge of the temple. And here comes Peter and John, you know, Peter was a man. Peter was going, this is just a bad thing. They're saying, you know, how did this happen? And then, of course, they inquire, and, and you know, he, he goes forth and says, hey, this is not done by our power. It's done by the power of Jesus, whom you crucified. Now, that's, people are really seeing, you know, that, And a lot of people got it converting over, and so now they're losing followers. And, and the whole thing is kind of crumbling around them, and yeah. so you know, you got to put these guys away. You can't catch it. They, they don't want the competition. That's right. And that seems to be a constant theme in Peter's preaching. Yeah. This Jesus of the Nazarene whom you crucified, yeah. you know, pointing the finger at him, who you, you did it. Anybody else? Thank you, Will. Wes. It's kind of like when Paul, when the Apostle Paul was on trial later on. And he says, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees, no such thing. The Pharisees, yes, there are. And they start arguing among themselves. Great tactical move by Paul. <laughs> but, but you're right. Uh, anybody else? Yep. That the miracle could not be denied. So something happened. This man was healed, and now we need to figure out how to stop this. So I like Peter's response where he says, if we're on trial for doing a good deed to somebody who's been lame his entire life, okay. But let me tell you why this happened. And he follows it up with the direct statement that Jesus gives in Luke 20 as he's talking about the parable of the Mm -hmm. where he, Jesus specifically mentions that he is the cornerstone. So he's preaching the same message as Jesus. He's healing just like Jesus. And the resurrection is consistent with what Jesus said in that chapter as well to the Sadducees about the text in Exodus chapter 3 where God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. How he is. So it's the same consistent message all throughout. And the problem is that it's So Peter was essentially pleading guilty. Yeah, we did it, but it was it wasn't it really wasn't us. It was Jesus, the Nazarene, and it would have been great. It was Jesus the Nazarene whom you crucified? Just to keep poking the bear, as it were. But uh, one thing that I've noticed in reading this, all kidding aside, is that Peter wasn't snarky. Peter was respectful to the authorities. They asked him a sincere question. He gave them a sincere answer as that answered the question directly. Uh, he wasn't uh, being as snarky as perhaps I, I sometimes read into these passages because that's who I am. Uh, 
So going on in verse 13, well, verse uh, 11, where he says that Jesus is he, meaning Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you who are the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This is problematic to the Jewish leaders, this particular statement, because Peter is saying that Jesus is the only name that could provide salvation. There is no other name. So continuing on, verse 13, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize him as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. The Sanhedrin was essentially poleaxed because Peter and John were not uh, educated men. They were fishermen. They worked, they were laborers. They were from some podunk part of Israel that... Uh, you know, that never produces kings and, and rulers and great men of learning and, and that sort of thing. Uh, also, the, the uh, court members observed that Peter and John were confident. They were uneducated and untrained, and they recognized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. We know that John was uh, with, with him throughout the crucifixion and took care of Mary, Jesus' mother. Peter was there until he denied him three times, but I suspect that he was probably still, he probably still witnessed the crucifixion, given the relationship between uh, Jesus and, and Peter. Uh, and, and as Matt just brought out, in seeing the man who had been healed before them, they were speechless. They could not deny what was before their eyes. But not only them, but everybody in Jerusalem, at least everybody in the temple that day who witnessed the healing, they saw what, what had happened. And so they, there, is, there are too many witnesses for the leadership to come up with some other story to deny what had happened. So what do they do? Uh, in verse 15, but when they had ordered them, ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. Essentially, the council took a recess. John and Peter were escorted from the room. And they started talking to each other, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in, his, in this name. So that's what they come up with. You know, we, what are we going to do? We can't deny it. We'll bring them back, we'll speak to them sternly, tell them not to speak in the name of Jesus ever again. And when they summoned them, verse 18, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So Peter is saying, essentially, no way, Jose. If it's a choice between listening to you or obeying what God clearly has told us that we ought to be doing and who Jesus commanded us in the Great Commission to be doing, Sorry, it, we're, you, know, you judge for yourself whether it's more important to obey you or to obey God. Kind of a rhetorical question. Everybody knew what the answer was. 
and when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. They let Peter and John go not because they were innocent, not because they didn't want to punish them, but they were concerned for the crowd, what that would happen. And remember that backdrop of Roman occupation, that if things got out of control so that the temple god could not maintain order, well, there was a, a you know, a Roman, uh, I don't know if it was a cohort or how many Roman soldiers were garrisoned in the area, but it had to be a significant number that were ready to put down any rebellion, any, uh, any trouble that the uh, temple gods could not handle. So it's uh, that time again. Normally we would go five, ten minutes more. I mean, that's park standard time. But there's a new sheriff in town. We're going to try and finish out on time. I'm going to try and finish on time. Uh, uh, so thank you for your comments. Thank you for the discussion. And we will begin there next Wednesday, which is